In each one, will you take a Bible and turn to Romans 8 and verse 38? And uh, that verse and the next one is what we're studying over these Sundays, Romans 8 and verse 38 and 39, and it's page 983 in that Revised Standard Version, 983, Romans 8 and verse 38. And it runs like this. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. All other loves end at the grave. However strong the present material or human support is that you have, it will not be able to do anything for you beyond the grave. And indeed, it will be able to do very little or nothing for you in an earthquake or in the event of a nuclear war. Indeed, faced with the massive disasters that are beginning to take place in our world, any love but that of an infinite creator will be worthless to you. But the love of the infinite creator will be effective for you even after the grave. Indeed, you won't be able to be separated from it whatever things to come may happen. And it's those things to come that we're talking about these two Sundays. Now, loved ones, if you're here this morning for the first time, or if you're an agnostic, it's really important that you understand that all that we're going to say today depends on our belief that Jesus is the Son of the Creator of the universe. And intellectually and experientially, we have come to that conclusion. And it's because of that that we trust the description he gives of the events that are about to take place in our world. Now, I fully understand that if you're a happy old agnostic, or if you're here for the first time, you won't have very much ground for believing these things. But I would just want to say that to you, that we don't believe these things because they're said by anybody. We believe them Because Jesus is the Son, the unique, only begotten Son of the Creator of the universe. And He has described these things, and His disciples have passed them on to us. And that's why we really believe them. Last Sunday, we talked about the period of time that would occur between now and what is known as the rapture. And you remember we shared that in many ways we would probably solve a lot of our problems. Over the next decade or so, we'll probably solve the energy crisis. We'll probably produce enough solar power from outer space even to solve our energy crisis. And we'll probably solve our food crisis. Probably by irrigation and increased crop yields, we'll overcome the shortage of food throughout the world. The thing that we won't be able to overcome is the increasing selfishness that will develop in our world the more it possesses. That's just a fact of human nature that you've experienced in your own life. The more you have, the more you want. And we will not be able to overcome that increasing selfishness. And the greed will develop so powerfully, not only among the third world nations, but among our own nations. The greed will develop so strongly that nobody will be able to hold down the desire for more and more things. And the greed will produce crippling strikes and international embargoes and international distrust among all peoples. 
And so we'll be a world filled with plenty, but a world that wants so much of it for itself that eventually the whole international economic and political system will begin to grind to a stop. Now, it's at that moment that the spirit of Antichrist, which is already in our world, because the seeds of all these things that we're talking about, you're no fools, you can see, they're already here. The spirit of Antichrist that is already in our world will at that crisis time produce the only alternative to chaos. And we'll be faced by such chaos, produced by every man doing what is right in his own eyes, and by every man trying to gather as much of the possessions of the world for himself, we'll face such chaos, such a grinding stop in the world system, that we will be forced at that moment to choose the only alternative to chaos. And that will be totalitarian dictatorship. And there will arise a great antichrist figure, a human being, who will offer to superimpose upon the whole world system, upon the legal system, the political system, the economic system, to superimpose an order that will again get the world systems operating. And loved ones, we will so have rejected Christ as the only answer to greed and selfishness that we will be faced with either chaos or totalitarian dictatorship. And the world will swarm to the answer of totalitarian dictatorship. And this Antichrist will take over. Now, he will probably bring peace to the world. He probably will. The rule of one human will over four billion, five billion, whatever we are there, ten billion people, will bring peace because he will force everyone to do what he wants. And you know yourselves that certainly that brings a degree of order brings complete domination and uh, complete destruction of free will, but it brings peace and order. And there will be peace at the time that this great event will take place that we discussed last day. And maybe you'd like to look at the verse that uh, describes that. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 1 through 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And verses 1 through 3. It's page 1031. 1031. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 1. But as the, to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, the day of the Lord there means all these events, loved ones, all the events that will take place over the next ten years after the thing is initiated by this, what we call the rapture. When people say there is peace and security, and that's why we believe that the Antichrist will bring peace and security. When people say there is peace and security then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail comes upon a woman with child and there will be no escape. Now at that moment, the rapture will occur. Many people think of the rapture as Jesus' return. Really, it isn't. Jesus does not return at the moment of the rapture to establish his rule on the earth. He returns and catches up to him in the air those of us who have died to every love but his. Those of us who really are the children of the Father of the universe. And Jesus will take us up to himself. That's why it's called the rapture. We will be raptured up with him into heaven. Now, that's explained there just in the chapter before. You see, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15, that's the description of the rapture. And that will be the first event that takes place in all these series of events that cover a great number of years and are known as the day of the Lord. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, 
who are left until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, this is the rapture, will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's all those who have died over the past thousands of years and who know Jesus. They will rise first. Then we who are alive, those of us who are alive at that time, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. And that, loved ones, is, is how uh, the Bible describes that first event. And uh, I'll try to, to uh, uh, outline it gradually to you uh, on uh, the, the overhead. And that will, that will be the beginning of the day of the Lord, you see. The rise of the Antichrist and the spirit of peace, and then the rapture. And the rapture will mean that those of us who do know Jesus will be with him in heaven, like that. Now then, during the next ten or ten and a half years, because you cannot tell when the rapture will take place, really. Jesus told us, nobody knows when that's going to take place. You may, you know, say, well, when there's peace, when there's a great time of peace, perhaps. But no one actually knows when that will occur. But after the rapture, you can tell from Revelation when things will occur. And over the next ten or ten and a half years, there will be three series of events which will take place simultaneously. Some of them will take place in heaven. Some of them will take place in the remnant of the church. Because, you see, the nominal church will continue on the earth when those of us who really trust Jesus have been taken to be with him in heaven. The nominal church will continue. And there will be events that will occur there. And then there will be another series of events that will occur among those of us who have nothing to do with Jesus at all. Now, it's important to remember that because if you read Revelation and think that every chapter follows chronologically the other, you'll be led astray. The fact is that there are three series of events that take place simultaneously and are described in Revelation. And that's why I'd encourage you to look at Bloomfield's book because he has really outlined that very clearly. Now, loved ones, the first event that will occur will be in heaven. When those of us are taken up into heaven, then Satan himself will be cast down into the earth. He'll be cast out of the spiritual position that he holds, not in heaven, but the spiritual position that he holds in the world of spirits. And he will be cast down onto the earth. Now, you'll see that in Revelation 12 and verse 9. Revelation 12 and verse 9. It's page 1079. And you just have to, loved ones, get used to the symbols that are used uh, in connection with the last days. And, of course, Satan is uh, referred to as the dragon. Romans, uh, Revelation 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent. See, he's referred, you remember, as a, to as a serpent in Genesis. Who is called the devil and Satan the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And then, loved ones, Satan will begin to persecute the nominal church that has been left on the earth. That's what he'll do. Once he's thrown down to the earth, he'll begin to persecute the nominal church that is left there. And that's Revelation 12 and verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 of Revelation 12. Rejoice then, O heaven, and you that dwell therein. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had borne the male child. You remember last Sunday we talked about the woman as the church and the male child as those who were real in the relationship to Jesus. It was the male child, those who really loved Jesus, that were caught up into heaven. But the woman, the nominal church, remained. And Satan begins to persecute that church. Now, this is the period of unprecedented persecution known, you remember, as the tribulation. And that's in Matthew 24. 
Matthew chapter 24. That's why it's important, loved ones, not to be foolish and start fearing persecution in these days, really. Because this will occur at this moment. Matthew 24, verse 9, when Satan is cast down to the earth and has nothing to restrain him. Matthew 24 and verse 9. And of course, Jesus is talking to all who are connected with him in any way, not those only who are present as he speaks. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false Christs, false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because wickedness is multiplied, most men's love will grow cold. And that time will be unprecedented persecution, loved ones, because the Holy Spirit at the moment restrains wickedness. He does. You may look around and think, boy, he's not restraining much. But really, loved ones, the Holy Spirit is holding back wickedness in our present world. He is. Through a thousand things, through even our broken down ramshackle legal system, the Holy Spirit is holding back wickedness. Now, at this time when Satan is cast down to the earth, God will withdraw the Holy Spirit from restraining the spirit of lawlessness. So that we will be able to see, and Satan and all who follow him will be able to see, where their unrestrained wickedness will take them. And uh, that's taught plainly, if you like to look at it, in Second Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians 2 and verses 3 to 10. And it's page 1032. 1032. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. And so at the time when Satan begins to persecute the church, the restraining power of the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn. And so wickedness will possess the world virtually completely except for one small area. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come. That is, the day when Jesus himself returns to establish his rule upon the earth. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness, that is the Antichrist, now possessed by Satan himself. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. He means the Holy Spirit is restraining him now. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it, that is the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is out of the way, until the Holy Spirit is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by his appearing at his coming. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are to perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And that describes, loved ones, the kind of lawlessness that will occur at that time as Satan possesses the body of the Antichrist and then gains complete military control of the whole earth. And that is described in Revelation 13. Revelation 13 and verses 7 through 8. Revelation 13 and verses 7 through 8. Revelation 13 and verse 7. It's page 1080. I do really encourage you, loved ones. I know that I'm moving through a lot of references, but I know that it's on cassette, and if you want to go back and study it carefully, you know you can get the cassette uh, after the service or, or some other Sunday. Revelation 13 and verse 7. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it, that is the beast or Satan possessing the Antichrist. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Every one whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. And then, loved ones, at that same time, a series of events will be taking place in heaven. 
Because those of us who do know Jesus will be there with him. And we will begin to undertake the responsibilities we have for administering God's judgments and for administering his grace. And at this time, God will administer judgments to the earth. So while Satan is bringing about his chaos, God himself will send plagues and famines upon the earth. And that's the only thing that will in any way hold the evil and the wickedness of Satan back. And the only thing that will enable anything to happen in the nominal church. So one of the first things that will happen is explained in Matthew 24 and verse 14. There will be no one on the earth to preach the gospel at that time except the nominal church. And so the gospel will be preached partly by those of us who are in heaven. It will be preached and manifested on the earth. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this is page 859, loved ones, 859. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, some of you may wonder, oh, well, why is that place there? And why do you say it will be preached at that time? Well, that's the only meaning you can give to the white horse that is described in Revelation 6 and verses 1 through 2, if you like to look at it. Revelation 6 and white always refers to those who have washed their garments, white, and it always refers to Jesus. And so you get the mention of that in Revelation 6 and verses 1 through 2. It's page 1075. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say as with a voice of thunder, Come. And I saw and behold a white horse, and its rider had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The meaning of that is that Jesus, through those of us who are with him, will preach the gospel to even the nominal church. And at that time, some of the nominal church will actually be saved. And you get that in Revelation 7 and verses 13 through 14. In other words, there will be what, is, what are called tribulation saints. There will be people who will be saved at that time, but only really as by fire. Revelation 7 and verses 13 through 14. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And whence have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And loved ones, part of the reason why they will be shaken into a sense of reality is because of the tremendous plagues that will come upon the earth at that time. And you might uh, look at the same Revelation 6 and verses 3 through 4. And here are outlined the other horsemen that come forth. And this is what God and those of us who are in Jesus will be partly responsible for, the administering not only of grace, but also of judgment to the earth. Revelation 6 and verse 3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that men should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So there will be mighty wars at that time. And then in verse 8, And I saw and behold a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. Because the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn, all kinds of pestilence and famine and all kinds of chaos will reign in the natural world. And then in verse 12, When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. See, the Holy Spirit holds all these things together. It is him that holds the protons and neutrons together. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the generals and the rich and the strong and everyone slave and free hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come 
and who can stand before it. In the midst of all of that, loved ones, the Antichrist will still, by his own signs and wonders, rule over great parts of the earth. He will not be able to prevent those who are saved, and he will not be able to prevent a special group in Israel being saved, because at that time, part of the Israelites will actually come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah. I would just like to share with those of you who are more anxious to save the dear Jews than you are to save anyone else, that be careful. Do not be found trying to live in the next dispensation when you're in this one. Do you see that it's during this time that there will be that special number in Israel who will be saved? And it's mentioned there in Revelation 14 and verse 1. Revelation 14 and verse 1. It's page 1080. 1080. Then I looked, and lo, on Mount Zion in Israel stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. 144,000 of the Jews at that time will believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But loved ones, apart from those and the remnant in the nominal church that are saved and taken to be with Jesus, the great mass of the world's population will be under the heel of the Antichrist. And that's pointed out clearly, the situation that that will be in Revelation 13. That's the same page you're probably on, Revelation 13 and verse 11. Then I saw another beast which rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. And this is the Antichrist possessed by Satan. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Because probably you remember the Antichrist will be killed at some point and Satan will come in and take over his body and appear to produce a resurrection like Jesus. It works great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of men. And by the signs which it has allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, bidding them make an image for the beast which was wounded by the sword and yet lived. That's that resurrection. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. And Satan gave breath to the image of the Antichrist, so that the image of the beast should even speak, and to cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Loved ones, I would ask you not to be foolish in these days. These things take place then, after the rapture, during these ten and a half years that we're talking of. So, by all means, let's tear the government apart for their social security system and all the rest of it. But let's not be silly, you know. Maybe there's a foreshadowing of this time when we'll all be numbered and no one will be able to move. Maybe there is a foreshadowing in the fact that the bank records are public uh, property uh, and the federal authorities can tell your whole life if they want to. Maybe there's a foreshadowing of it, but that is not the mark of the beast. This mark of the beast will occur in an intense way at this time. Verse 17, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. It will be the only way, of course, Satan will be able to bring order into the world. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast. For it is a human number, its number is 666. And why the Bible says this calls for wisdom is there are a lot of, there's a lot of foolishness connected with that number. And it is very difficult for any of us to see the real meaning of that. And be slow on all the so-called pretenses at giving Hebrew letters to, uh, to the value of the numbers. Really, you can almost prove that anybody is the Antichrist if you play around with it. So be content, be humble in the presence of God's wisdom, you know. Say there are some things here we can understand, there are some things that beyond us are be beyond us. And don't let's be foolish about them. Now, loved ones, at that time, when Satan is then at the height of his power, Jesus will return. 
And so, really, that's, that's the way it looks up to that point. These are the ten and a half years. And you see that we will be caught up with Jesus into heaven, and then the gospel will be preached to all the world, and at the same time there will be that tribulation that we talked about. And out of that tribulation there will be saints who will be saved. And there will be wars and famines sent by God to the world to uh, declare to all men that this is not reality, what is happening. And then during that time will come the rule of Antichrist when that number will be printed and no one will be able to buy or sell without it. And then when Satan is at the height of his power in the Antichrist, Jesus will return to the earth. And it's then that will occur that tremendous battle known as the Battle of Armageddon, probably near the plain of Megiddo there in in the Middle East. And at that time, Jesus will defeat Satan and all his forces. And it's then, of course, that the judgment will take place, what is known as the great white throne judgment, when all peoples will be judged and will be judged according to the lives that have come from their faith or their lack of faith. And then, loved ones, it's at that time that Satan will be bound for a thousand years. And that's what's known as the millennium, you remember. That Jesus will bind Satan at that time for a thousand years. And that's when the saints will rule there on earth for a thousand years. That's called the millennium. And during that thousand years... The, those of us who really love Jesus and trust him will be used by him to reorganize the world. The world is a mess. It's nothing like it was when God first created it. Even the present climate of the world is not what it was when God first created it. But we in all kinds of ways have not only polluted the Pigalles of Paris, have not only polluted the La Perlas of San Juan, but we have destroyed and polluted all the world compared with what God meant it to be. And during those thousand years, we will share with Jesus the reorganizing and the renewing of his world. And then, loved ones, will occur that event that is described in Revelation 20 and verses 7 through 15. Revelation 20 and verse 7. It's page 1085. 1085. Revelation 20 and verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended... Satan will be loosed from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, that is, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven. So Satan will be released for a moment, but then defeated finally. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever, and then the judgment. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from his present earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it, Death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then, loved ones, the world will be completely renewed. And you remember there's the description of the holy city which may occur somewhere in space because you remember it's talked about as coming down from heaven, descending from heaven. Whether that is spatial or spiritual, you cannot tell. But by that time, presumably, we will uh, ourselves have instituted space travel and certainly when Jesus comes, the whole universe will then begin to be open to us. And the whole earth will be renewed completely. And then we will begin to be used by God to redeem the whole universe. And really, that's as far as the Bible takes us, loved ones. And so that seems to be the outline of the plan that Jesus tells us about the things to come. I don't ask you to argue about it or battle back and forth about it, but will you see that 
there's a great deal of the Bible that is devoted to this. Now, Jesus is recognized by all of us to be the wisest man that ever lived and to have lived the most perfect life that was ever lived. So let's see that he does not give so much of his message over to this time unless indeed these things will take place. So I would encourage you, those of you who have seen this for the first time, to maybe get the book, All Things New, get it settled in your own mind, and then forget it. And be what Jesus wants you to be in this present world. Those of you who have seen this for the first time and do not know Jesus, loved ones, honestly, these things will occur. They will. I'm not claiming that my interpretation is dead right in every issue, but there's too much of this stuff to ignore that this is, in fact, the way the world will go. And so I would encourage you, you know, who have not dealt with Jesus at all, to really see that it possibly is a short time, you know.